Sarah Akbar, Chairperson and CEO of OilServe Kuwait and Non-Executive Director at Petrofac. Sarah, welcome back to the table. I'm really keen to get your views on this sort of what appears to be a growing war, a growing war of words between particularly the US and Saudi Arabia on this OPEC plus cut. But clearly, Saudi Arabia has rallied all of its allies in OPEC plus to make their supporting statements, including Kuwait. Your thoughts on this situation? So, uh, good morning, Sean. Good, good morning, morning to everybody. I've been, it's been a while since I joined, but uh, yes, glad nice to be here. So the situation, I think, as you see, you know, without the interference from OPEC Plus, the prices were, was slipping down, and they can see, even if you see at all the forecasts from EIA as well, they are forecasting less demand next year. So... Ahead of that, I think OPEC decided that let's go and try to keep a base for the price they are targeting. I mean, they are saying we are not targeting 90, but it looks like they want 90 to be the floor simply because they have all you know, benefited from the cycle and they know that this is probably the last cycle they will see an oil price and they have to maximize their revenues. They are committed to big programs in development in all of these countries. So I believe the most uh, important element for them is truly economic, although, you know, um, I, I cannot discount that there is a political element to this. I mean, I, I see the fury in the US and they believe this is uh, interfering with the US midterm elections. And I mean, this was never the intention, but, uh, you know, uh, the intention is to keep their economies, their own uh, economics working for their countries. And it is the, uh, you know, the time for them to be making uh, the surplus money they need for the development of these countries. So the driver is economic, but I don't just discount the other impacts, the political impacts that this have on the On that point, OPEC announced, uh, as we was discussing, and uh, a fairly uh, muscular two million barrel a day quota cut. Uh, and I wanted to get your sense about what that translates to, uh, uh, will translate to, obviously, the 1st of November that it commences. But coming at a time when, as far as I can see across the Gulf region, all producers are increasing capacity as much as possible. The last thing they're thinking about doing right now is cutting. Yes. So the reality of the cuts, as you know, the actual quota in OPEC is not fully achieved. There is a shortage of something like uh, 800,000 barrels a day from the actual quota. So the reality of the 2 million, it's more like cutting probably 800 to 900,000 barrels and that's it because the balance was never there, you know? So politically speaking, 2 million is a big number as you, know, as you can see, but the reality it's really something like 800, 900 that will come mainly from four or five countries. One of them, Iraq said, I can't do it. Although, you know, they said, okay, we will go ahead with the cut, but the reality, they cannot cut anything from Iraq. So I don't know. It, 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 I, I'm, I'm sure there will be, uh, you know, going forward, a different kind of uh, commitment to the cut. If you remember, three years ago, whenever they had cut, they never committed to the cut and people were cheating around and so on. I think at this point in time, this will come back because, as you said, people have invested in increasing capacity. Although not much being added really, because as you know, the cycle of investment takes time before you can really add production. So the production, the, the investments they, have, uh, they are already making now will not show up except by towards the end of 23 probably. But, anyhow, but if, you, if you take the four countries, uh, the GCC countries that are involved here, Saudi, Kuwait, UAE and Oman, I doubt Oman is gonna be making any cuts. Uh, 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 Kuwait, your expectation Probably, yeah kuwait can do because we uh you know we i and we were talking about this before we started the session 
we, when we commit, we commit and that's it. So we apply what we commit, we stick to the word and we just go ahead. So Kuwait have the flexibility to cut and we have, you know, uh, in our budget currently, we have surplus, we have this. So we are really not in a position to say, no, we cannot commit because we have issues or whatever. So Kuwait will definitely commit. Saudi will commit because they are driving this. Um, I think the UAE, if you remember, before this cut, they were the ones who were really resisting any cuts. As a matter of fact, at certain point in time, they came out and they said, no, this was not fair. Our quota was not right and so on. And they really invested in adding production. So it will be tough a little bit for the UAE, but I think in the spirit of trying to keep the momentum and the movement, uh, they may do some cut, but I believe none of the other OPEC countries will cut anything. Sarah, I wanted to get your thoughts as well about the, the sort of political situation vis-a-vis -vis U.S. Gulf relations. I mean, it, clearly they're under stress with Saudi Arabia. Is this something that the wider GCC should be concerned about? Of course, Kuwait has a special historical relationship with the U.S. in terms of how they uh, supported your security 30 odd years ago. Uh, I'm just wondering... Are we at a tipping point to a new era, or is this just kind of a noisier version of business as usual? Well, this is a very tough question. Uh, through well, it's the question everybody's trying to answer at the moment. It's a very tough question for everyone because, you know, the last last week, Mohammed bin Zayed visited Putin and they showed extraordinary intimacy and relationship. And so what came out from that? And second day after that, Mohammed bin Salman, the prince came out and he said, we will try our best to find a peaceful resolution for the Russian-Ukrainian kind of uh, war. So the way the GCC is putting their effort is to try to make peace everywhere, even with the US and so they are balancing their political moves with, with the economic moves that uh, happen. Genuinely, everybody in the GCC is concerned about the development and the relationship between Saudi and between the US. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we are as far as political front uh, or a coalition, we are a coalition. GCC is a coalition. It is very intertwined. We have so many, it's just not agreement. It's just uh, same people, we are same, we are one unit. And whatever happens to the unit, we all share. And that's why everybody, we cannot say, oh, wait, we have nothing to do with this. Or the UAE say, oh, we cannot, we have nothing to do. No, no, we are all in it and we have to do it together. And that's why you will see some orchestrated efforts between the various GCC playing various parts and trying to cool down this you know, uh, issue between the US and Saudi because genuinely it is not only Saudi, everybody was in OPEC plus and everybody take the decision together, regardless if they come and say afterwards, oh, we were pushed to do this or that. You, take the, you took the decision jointly to cut production in order to safeguard your economic interest. You have all the right to do so, and we should all defend it together. So we are concerned, but like you see now, there are various elements playing various tactics in order to cool off this and try to find the best way going forward. But truly this is, you know, quote unquote, uncertainty, big uncertainty, and everybody is, uh, we are thinking jointly how to do things together rather than each one doing his own bit. Your thoughts on that from a, an ongoing strategy point of view, of course, we, we had uh, the increase right through this year uh, until August, then we had a reversal uh, uh, of a cut in September, an insignificant 100,000, then from November, 2 million uh, quota now, it's all quota uh, nonetheless, but uh, the quota, uh, uh, going forward, further cuts to keep defending $90 oil. Is that viable, do you think, Sarah? Well, um, really not. I don't see where they can cut and who will cut. It will be, for example, Saudi again 
volunteering a big cut like they did before. But other than that, I don't really see other countries pushing to get any sort of cut. And you know, because our industry is this cyclical. So the example here is the three refineries that are going to start production sometime first quarter next year. I know in the Kuwait, they already started one unit and the two other units will be coming. Which is a huge refinery system. in Kuwait, right? It's 600,000 barrels. Exactly. And then you have uh, the Jezan one and, and the one in Oman. So you will have by in the first quarter next year, you will have more than enough capacity. And it is the same, like it happens every time. So things come at a point where it looks like you have more surplus in the market of products and then the prices go down. But the two other thing that really has impact is the chip industry. You know, all the car manufacturers have been very slow in providing cars. So you, you can see if you request, if you wanna buy a car now, you have to queue in a line because they don't have enough chips. But well, all the showrooms on Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai are actually empty. You go in there, there's no cars available, no new ones. It is because of the chips, but this is coming to an end as well, because as, as a reaction to what happened with the chips, there are many chip factories now that will be providing. So towards the end of this year, you will see many more cars coming into the market, which will add to the consumption that we lost in probably during this year as well. So the reality can OPEC cut more for the existing countries and OPEC plus the only country that can chip in and do like what they did before is Saudi for the rest. I really doubt anyone can come in and add uh, to any of the additional cuts. Like I said, the, the already 2 million is a way stretched target than uh, the reality. So there is a big gap. Well, there's the, the other point, Sarah, to, that we welcome your thoughts on is that the massive cuts that were made during the pandemic period uh, has had lasting impact on the health of reservoir management across the OPEC plus countries, hence the struggle to rebuild production without serious investment of dollars. That is also the risk in this equation, isn't it? And, and this year, specifically 22, we have seen 60% reduction in exploration and in investment in exploration. And exploration is actually what feeds into creating new reserves that can be developed and so on on the longer term. So in general, our industry as a producer is really not doing well from investment point of view. I think this year, the total investment in the upstream is like 170 billion, where we need something like 700 billion. And this will have lasting impact on how much you can produce and what capacity is there. And this is good, it's not just our uh, industry. 